on Friday the 13th of October in 1961, uh, I received a call, of course it would be Friday the 13th, you know, uh, from a, um, uh, one of the executives at Universal Studios asking if I was the girl in the Sego commercial, the girl. And uh, apparently Alfred Hitchcock and his wife had been watching the Today Show of which, on which this commercial was playing a great deal. And it was one of those, um, it was a pet milk product called Seago. Uh, I think I weighed all of 100 pounds when I did it. The, for a diet At least drink. for a diet drink, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, he asked if I was the girl in the commercial. And uh, that's the first the girl that comes out. And apparently what had happened was Alfred Hitchcock saw the commercial and he called the executives at Universal and said, find the girl. <laughs> so that put me through a little bit of a uh, suspense thriller for about four days from Friday until that Tuesday. Uh, the, nobody told me who the producer was. It became a game, it became kind of fun. I thought I could trip them up, trap them, <laughs> as the saying goes in Marnie, um, uh, into telling me who it was. But it wasn't until Tuesday when I went to, I was asked to go to MCA, which is a huge uh, talent um, agency. And uh, it was then that I was told that uh, Alfred Hitchcock wanted to, meet, to sign me to a contract. And he said, here is the contract. If you look it over, and you agree with the terms and sign it, we'll go over to meet him. So I was under contract to Alfred Hitchcock before I even met him. This was not the first time, of course, that Hitch did this uh, with uh, someone he wanted to sign. And, and of course, at the time, Tippi had absolutely no idea that she was going to be the star of a major motion picture. In fact, you thought you might be doing some of his television shows, or yeah, well, at that at that time he was doing the weekly um, Hitchcock pre presents. Yeah. And then came the moment. I'm sure they'd love to hear about when you knew that you were going to play Melanie Daniels in the Birds. Well, there first became um, a, a very extensive screen test that. Um, uh, and I thought, oh, this happens to everybody when they come to Hollywood. Doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, Edith Head, first of all, was called in to do an extensive wardrobe for me, uh, dealing with anything that you could possibly do, whether they were pants and suits, uh, afternoon clothes, cocktail clothes, ball gowns, cocktail, I mean, the most beautiful clothes. And um, then he decided to do uh, scenes from Rebecca, Notorious, and Catch a Thief, three entirely different women. Martin Balsam was flown out to be like my leading man, because there aren't any other men in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was rather odd, but then, <laughs> anyway. Bob Burks, the DP who were, had been working on all of Hitch's films, the entire film crew um, was all done in color. Um, uh, it, was, it was an amazing time. Uh, I will never forget it. Yeah. Tibby, if you, if you would give them just a little précis, not from my lips but from yours, um, about when the hardships started during the making of the birds in 1962, about when the first filming began and you, you saw that, I mean, she's in practically every scene, as you know, and, and, and the demands were yeah. considerable, just the technical demands. Well, uh, not only the technical demands of it, but um, uh, the fact that I was uh, the leading female in a, uh, a film that uh, the studio didn't think it should have picked me for. Why would, uh, and their question was, why would you pick an unknown to take on a lead that is as strong as this? And uh, so I was, I was um, 
bucking a lot of negativeness uh, at the, from the, the studio heads, which was extremely difficult. And, and um, had Hitchcock not given me the assurance that I could do this role, I, I rather doubt whether I, I could have done it. Um, and all of those feelings went um, extremely well for uh, months. You know, the birds took six months to film. And uh, it wasn't until the very ending of, of the filming that um, I started noticing that um, uh, he kept watching me, staring at me. And uh, whether we were on the set or whatever, he'd be standing off talking to people, carrying on a conversation and staring at me. Eventually, that becomes um, uh, almost like stalking. And uh, it was a very uncomfortable situation. And um, uh, I became very, very good at getting out. I've always, I would always have somewhere to go, had to be somewhere, had something to do, had to um, uh, have a meeting with makeup, had to have a meeting with whatever I could think of to, um, to get out of a situation. And, um, uh, and at the same time, I was having an incredibly wonderful time um, uh, acting and doing this role. I mean, it was an incredible opportunity and uh, a responsibility that was enormous. And uh, I treasured it. And I, I, um, uh, I kept hoping that this, this encroachment would stop. And uh, after the birds was, uh, uh, we were finished with it, then there was a period of time where um, nothing was happening, uh, excepting that they were started to prepare Marnie. And it was during the, during, uh, um, the filming of Marnie uh, in fact, I remember exactly the scene that uh, Rod Taylor and I were doing. We were up on the bluff where we are During talking birds, about yeah. our mothers, mm -hmm. you know, and it was that scene uh, when um, Hitch's agent told me that I was going to play Marnie. It was he who, not, not Hitch, it was the agent. But then, of course, in addition to being in practically every sequence of Marnie, then the situation became really, really intolerable, didn't it? It did. Yeah, it did. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, any of you uh, have, uh, women have had uh, uh, the horrible experience of being uh, the object of someone's obsession. Have any of you? I don't know whether you'd even answer that, but... Um, <laughs> If you have, you would know exactly what that is like, and it is oppressive um, and um, frightening. And, um, and you find out that you've been followed, and you find out that your handwriting has been analyzed, and you find out um, uh, that you're being spied upon and uh, uh, made demands that you would never acquiesce under any circumstance. And it becomes um, an, a situation of not being able to uh, um, deal with it, not wanting to deal with it, yeah. and not dealing with it. Or I should say I dealt with it by becoming uh, a master at getting out of the room, having a reason to get out of the room, and um, so that I wouldn't have to be um, alone with him. Could this happen today, do you think? Ah, uh, no, it couldn't. See, I was at the end of the studio system, and um, all those years of, of the studios and the, 
having all of the actors uh, under contract and they would be having acting lessons, they would have be singing lessons, dancing lessons, everything to give them the tools to uh, become whatever character that they might be asked to play. That isn't done anymore. Um, but there was also that underlying uh, 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 situation of it always being okay, whatever the director wanted from his actors, uh, be they male or female or whatever. Uh, if demands were made, most of the time, mm -hmm. the women or the actor acquiesced to whatever those were. And, um, but there was nobody, even if you didn't want to do that, if it would, as was with me, there was no one that I could go to to say, this is what is happening and it's wrong. There was nobody to go to. No. Today, if this happened to me, I'd be a very rich woman. <laughs> <laughs> the phrase sexual harassment didn't exist in those no, days. No, it didn't. In addition to which, of course, and Hitch knew what he was doing in casting an unknown. Cary Grant came on the set of The Birds, right, and said to you, you're a very brave lady. He said, I, I think you're the bravest woman I've ever met. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure that's the adjective. <laughs> Maybe. But of course, he couldn't have invited a, an established, already well-known actress. She'd come onto the set and, and they would tell her that real live birds were gonna be thrown at her for what turned out to be a week. She would have said, the hell, I'm out of here. <laughs> you wouldn't have done it. Tibby, I believe, took this as, well, I'm going to do what's required of me. I'll get through it. I'll play the role, you know. But, but you didn't know it was going to be five days of hell. No, I didn't. <laughs> Tell us about um, the ending of the picture and the prospects for your future collaboration with him, the plans that he was making for you before the big explosion there were. Yeah, well, there were um, many talks of, of uh, films that we were going to do. There was a, a film already, um, actually, they were planning how to do it. It was a James M. Barry play called Mary Rose, very, very dark piece, uh, dealing with a, a family, an English family, who go on a vacation on a little island, and the mother disappears. She just disappears. And um, uh, with great consternation, they go back to England. And um, 25 years later, she reappears as a ghost. And um, all those years ago, in the, what, 65, 1965, we didn't have the sophistication that we do now in filmmaking and they couldn't figure out how to make her look like a ghost. There was talk of, of um, her having very kind of gossamer clothes and maybe put lights underneath the, yeah, none of it worked. So um, that idea was shelved. The footnote to this, of course, is that once Hitchcock dismissed Miss Hedron and, and treated her so shabbily, well, a universal, he, he, sorry dear, I, I, um, uh, I received a Golden Globe, and which was wonderful. And uh, around the same time, I received um, a Photoplay Award, and I was asked to go to New York to accept it on The Tonight Show. Well, we weren't finished with Marnie, and uh, I would have had to uh, leave on um, Thursday, evening and collect the award on Friday, but I would be back on Monday for, for work. And uh, so I went to uh, Mr. Hitchcock on, um, who, uh, he was in his office on the set. And um, uh, I asked if I could, that I, you know, I was excited about it. And uh, uh, that I needed to have a couple of days off to go to New York. And it was at, at that time when he made the demands on me that were just, were so offensive to me 
that it was right then and there that I stopped all of it. I just said, I, I am not going any further with this. When Marnie is over, I am going to be out of your, this contract. And um, he said, well, you can't. You have your daughter to take care of. Your parents are getting older. And uh, I said, nobody who loves me would want to be in a situation in which I am not happy. And I want to get out. He said, I'll ruin your career. I said, do what you have to do. I'm gone. And um, he did. He did ruin my career. He kept paying me my $600 a week. And um, uh, after I got out of The Birds and Marnie, I was, as the expression goes, a hot actress. And um, I would later learn how many directors and producers wanted me for their films. And, uh, but in order to get me, they would have to go through him. And all he said, it was so easy. All he said was, she isn't available. And I would hear about so many of those directors and producers. And the one that really hurt the most was Francois Truffaut, Truffaut, who wanted me for one of his films. And um, I didn't even know about it.